Film and Arts en Downton Abbey. Downton Abbey, la serie británica que conquistó al mundo, vuelve a partir del 9 de marzo con su cuarta temporada, de la mano de Film and Arts, en exclusivo para toda Latinoamérica. Pero como no pudimos esperar hasta el estreno, viajamos a Londres y entrevistamos a los protagonistas. Lo primero que quisimos saber es cómo el enorme éxito de Downton Abbey en el público y la crítica especializada afectó la vida de los actores. Definitivamente, la gente es más consciente de ti, solo Stephen en la calle, ¿sabes? Especialmente en el tubo aquí en Londres, tengo muchas doble takes y la gente dice hola porque creen que me conocen, tal vez no. Fue mi primer trabajo de televisión. So it, you know, it really changed things professionally for me. The only thing it's definitely done is open doors for me. I think people are so positive about this show that it means, you know, in within acting and new jobs, I think people really take note, which is really nice. It's changed a lot for me as as an actor because I feel more secure in my career because I know that there's another series ahead. And I've bought a flat. <laughs> it's changed my life in the way, in the sense that I've got a mortgage. I could finally get a mortgage because being an actor and getting a mortgage is, is an absolute nightmare. It's, well, it's, it's near impossible. Dado que la serie se desarrolla en una época muy distinta a la nuestra, ¿cómo se inspiraron para componer los personajes? It's all there in the script, really. Um, I always uh, think I'm playing Julian Fellows because he's the godfather of the show and, uh, and Robert is the godfather of the upstairs part of the house, Mr. Carson being the father of the downstairs. So, um, I don't know, it's, uh, you, you know, you, you step onto that set in that beautiful location and uh, the grandeur of the house and the, and the enormous uh, feeling of the estate that is there, um, I think uh, does most of the work for me. Julian Fellows is an Oscar winner. You've got the Oscar for Gosford Park and he writes the show. So with good writing, you don't really need, I don't think you need to base it on anyone. It's all there in the script and you just, you just let the words speak for themselves and the character will come alive almost, you know, by magic. I was lucky enough, obviously, I play an Irish character and being from home, it was it was fascinating to go back and and find find people like Tom Branson who did go and it, forgetting about their political beliefs actually needed to go and find work. And taking a person like that who did that, it, it was much easier to bring him across then to to work for a family like like Lord Grantham, you know. And and from that point on, it was much easier then to, to build the, the surrounds and to find the struggle, the inner struggles for a character like that. I found that music helped a lot. Um, my character is really, she's, she finds, I don't know if I can say that, but she listens to records and she's obsessed with music. So I listen to like Al Jolson and these singers of the time to kind of infuse me with that energy. And, and I did a lot of dancing too, which she does throughout the series. So I did sort of the foxtrot and the one step and the two step and, um, and that really helped. I did a bit of research, you know, reading through books and stuff like that, but we're very lucky to have a fantastic historical advisor called Alistair Bruce. He's, we call him the Oracle because he knows everything about those times and the etiquette and, uh, and he's connected with the now royal family, so he kind of knows what he's talking about. And for me, it's very much about the voice of the character. That's how I, I, I get into the role. And then, of course, the costumes are, you know, they help. To get into the character. Y hablando de personajes, quisimos saber si en la vida real serían amigos de ellos o de alguien de características similares. I've met several Roberts in my time. Um, I think personally, if I met him at a party, I'd probably have a nice 20 minute conversation with him. That would be it. I've got very little in common with him, really. It's funny, I have a relationship with my character a bit like an older sister and a younger sister. I'm kind of the oldest, like, come on, grow up and, you know, behave yourself. And I kind of sometimes find her extremely infuriating. What, a homosexual underbuller? <laughs> There's not many of them about, really, believe it or not. Would I be friends with my character? I probably would be friends, but we'd have a lot of arguments. I don't think I'd agree with a lot of his points. I don't know that I know anyone like Edith, and I, I hope I would be her friend. I think it would be a bad idea to cross her. Um, but um, I, I think everyone can sort of sympathise with Edith. She's a very strong, strong woman, but she can be, she can be quite spiteful. And um, yeah, I'm, I, I'd like to be friends with her, but I think it would. Uh, It would take a while. <laughs> y finalmente llegamos a lo que más nos intriga, la cuarta temporada. ¿Qué esperan de los nuevos episodios y cuáles son los retos para su personaje? I think now that the audience has invested in these characters so much, 
uh, it's returned to much more of a character-based show, less plot, less time moving on. It's much, uh, I think this whole series only takes place over a year rather than the uh, slightly faster pace we had certainly in series two. All of the characters at the beginning of this series are all dealing with the news of, of Matthew's death. So, But for Edith, there is a sort of an, another sort of light at the end of the tunnel is, is her life in London and she has this relationship with her editor who is in love with her and she's sort of deciding what to do about that because I think as much as she clearly feels the same way it's complicated because he's married. She's slowly coming out of her bereavement so it does take a long time for her to adjust again and she's very reluctant to meet other other men even though they're being thrown in her direction and she's bonding slowly with the baby she's not the most maternal of of mothers which for me has been a challenge because I love children so I find it hard to have to be reserved with them my instinct is to be all cooey and you know cuddle them <laughs> Her challenges, I think she cha her challenges are to try and fit in. Uh, she really wants to have fun and kind of push the boundaries of what young girls are allowed to do, but with that she can't entirely ruin the reputation of the family and also get herself in so much trouble that she could lose her position. And So she's towing a fine line between enjoying herself and behaving. As a treat for his lordship, a London band is coming to play after dinner. A London band? That's the berries. From a nightclub called the Lotus. A nightclub, my lady? Really? We see uh, Thomas is back at Downton Abbey working, uh, and you'd think the experiences of last season would have made him more humble and more sort of gracious towards his fellow man, but no, no, he's, he's just as bad and just as evil and angry as he always was. Because you are sly and oily and smug, and I'm really pleased I got the chance to tell you before I go. Well, if we're playing the truth game, <laughs> then you're a manipulative little witch, and if your schemes have come to nothing, I'm delighted. Tom Branson's challenges this year come down to the fact that he still doesn't really know where he sits within the society that he now belongs. You know, he has a role, he has a job in Downton Abbey, and he's, he is the estate manager, but in relation to the family, he doesn't really have a status or a place to sit, and he starts representing the house at all these big parties that, that happen and these big functions but he doesn't really he doesn't know how to interact with these people and, and it just keeps niggling away at him the fact that you know this isn't really where he belongs and it's an issue that, that Tom has to deal with throughout season four. She enjoys it. It gives her a surrogate real life. What do you think Tom? Do you think she minds? Tom? I'm sorry, what were you saying? I'd far rather know what you were thinking. I think this series, you see Ivy growing up. You know, she's a young girl, and when she, when she um, joined the household staff in series three, everything was new. She's very innocent, naive, you know, wide-eyed. The first time she sort of had a proper job, first time she'd spent a lot of time with boys. Um, you know, so she's very much finding where she is in the world. Uh, my expectations have been surpassed in the way that I'm speaking to you from Argentina and Argentina watch our show. I mean, no one envisaged that. Uh, it's huge in America. It's surpassed all our expectations. I was just happy for it to go again, you know, in this country, in the UK. That it's gone, it's been sold licensing over 200 territories is unbelievable. I think people will be really intrigued to see where it goes this year. It has brought about new, you know, new characters, of course, because there are new potential suitors for, for Mary. Um, and the story has, has really changed for many other characters, not just Mary. My expectations, my expectations are that no one tells me I'm bad in it. <laughs> as long as no one does that, I'll be happy. And as long as they don't get killed, you know. You know, we, they have a habit of uh, characters disappearing in the show, so I just don't want to be one of them. I think people will enjoy it. I've seen the first episode and, you know, I, I laughed and I cried. I think it, it is a, a great place to take these characters on from. And um, so I hope it's people enjoy it as much as they have previous series and more. Pero no nos podíamos ir sin apelar al buen humor de los actores 
y les hicimos dos últimas preguntas. ¿Qué haría su personaje si de pronto despertara en la actualidad? ¿Y cuál sería su primer tweet? <laughs> That's a very good question. What would you do first? In this century, oh God, that would be dangerous. <laughs> I think she'd be like Lindsay Lohan or something. He'd probably ask for his newspaper to be iron. Go to the nearest gay bar. <laughs> Because for, for the first time in his life, being gay, in this country anyway, would not be illegal. So he could finally find love. Well, he used to be a chauffeur, so I'm pretty sure he'd go check out the cars. <laughs> I think he'd be pretty amazed at the, at the advance in the mechanics. Uh, and he'd probably go and get an Aston Martin. I think she would wonder where her maid was. <laughs> I think she'd say, she'd, she'd be curious to know where Anna was. She'd have to dress herself. Um, she would have to cook for herself. She'd have to adapt um, a lot if she lived in, in this century. <laughs> I think she'd probably start ordering people around and, uh, and have a shock. Her first tweet would be, um, where, where is Carson? <laughs> His first tweet would be, is anybody out there? <laughs> Uh, something evil, something scary. Yeah. What would his first tweet be? <laughs> What is this? <laughs> Where's the party? <laughs> y antes de irnos, alguien tiene algo para decirnos. Keep watching Latin America. Downton Abbey, cuarta temporada, a partir del domingo 9 de marzo, solo en Filmaround.